How else are we going to walk in the light as he's in the light? Come on, it has to be possible or scripture wouldn't say. Well, nobody can walk in the light. He said to walk in the light. I can show you in the gospels where he looked at his guys and said, you're the light of the world. Well, I thought you were the light of the world, Jesus. I am, and I'm in you, and I'm going to the Father, so light it up. Let your light so shine before men so they see the life you're living, not the messages you're preaching, the life you're living. And then they glorify the Father. That's a Christian. You'll never do that if you're a Christian for your own sake. If you're just a Christian so you don't go to hell, that's what we preach all over the world. If you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. And we make the gospel continually serve us and maybe never transform us. The self-centeredness of fallen man has crept into the message. And the motive for getting born again isn't because I've been living separate from God with a different motive than he created me for. He said, if any of you are going to follow me, I need you to deny yourself. Pick up your and follow. What's pick up your cross? It means don't ever let sin against you produce sin in you. Don't ever repay evil for evil. Amen. Overcome evil with good. Amen. Walk in love. Ephesians 5.1. Walk in love just as Jesus loved. Not somewhat like, not close to, not as good as you can. Just like he loved and gave himself a sweet, fragrant aroma unto God. That's scripture. I could show you 1 John chapter 3. It says if you have this hope of eternal life and this hope of seeing him someday and, and the more you see him, the more we'll be like him, right? It says anyone that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. Not somewhat like. But you can't hardly preach that today in church because we've so learned ourselves through ourselves that we're following ourselves and not him. So the biggest line we get today as preachers is, well, brother, you got to keep it real. I'm keeping it real because he's the one from the beginning. There's nobody more real than him. He was here before us and nothing was made that wasn't made through him. He's not a truth. He's not a good idea. He's the truth. And he was and he is. And he is to come. You talk about keeping it real? Let's preach Jesus. We're not following each other. We're following him. And he's the head of all power and all principality. And it says we're complete in him. You think about the language, keep it real. Come on, brother, don't get high and spiritual. Keep it real. Stay relatable. We're relatable if we're following Jesus because that's what we're on the earth for. That's why the church hasn't experienced the freedom he paid for because we're still caught up in ourselves. It's still about us. That's why a simple word, somebody you put expectation on, all of a sudden breaks your heart. You get married, finding your identity through your marriage, but it ain't working out that way, and now you're devastated and broken. It could cripple you for the rest of your life and you still feel the need to be somebody. You could be married again and again and again. If you never get that straight, next thing you know, you're just bitter and angry and marriage don't even work. See, marriage is I love you, not I need you. Marriage never works when there's need in the middle. Christianity never works when there's need in the middle. So I love you, not do you love me. Jesus didn't come and say, I love you. Do you love me? He'd be a very insecure savior. No, he just came and said, love you. And that's all he said. And if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. And then this other motive creeps in and all of a sudden it's all about us and getting saved and going to heaven and getting blessed and getting provided for. What about Paul? He said, there's times I don't even have enough, but I don't change. Everything's the same. 
I'm content no matter what state I'm in because I know why I'm here now and I know why he's in me. Whew. I could show you scripture that says discouragement is never Christian. I could show you scripture that says grumbling and complaining is never Christian. <laughs> I got scripture on it all. I read the book. But you can hardly preach it because you ain't keeping it real because everybody's discouraged. Well, maybe we're following everybody. And because we're following everybody, we're not receiving the grace to be changed and made more like him. Maybe we ought to get back to following him because I don't see an ounce of discouragement in him. I mean, they beat him for his words, people. He's the truth. He's not speaking a good idea. He's the truth, and they killed him for his words. And he doesn't change. Why? Because he's Jesus? Because he's love. If he doesn't change because he's Jesus, then we can't follow him. If he doesn't change because he's love, now we're all in. And the goal of our instruction is love. He said, I give you a new commandment, but you had it from the beginning. Love one another. Not be mad, bicker, backbite, manipulate, use. Love one another. For God so. Aren't you glad it doesn't say he was so burned out by men and frustrated and at wit's end he finally sent his son? <laughs> so here's God who is love looking at humanity for generations and all the things we've done, saying one thing, doing another, going off the deep end, living in darkness. Paul said, it's a shame to even speak of the things people do in secret. Well, once you get to know the Lord, you'll realize there's no such thing as secret. Relationship with him is transforming. When you get to know him, you're changed. Why? Because he's always with you. If I hung out with you 24-7 and never left your side, there's things you'd never even consider doing just because I'm with you. <laughs> Wonder if you develop that with Jesus and you realize you're never alone. Watch what he says in 1 John 4. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is of God. And everyone, not some, not most, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Watch. He who loveth not doesn't know God. So the barometer, according to Scripture, of knowing him is your love. Not your commitment, not your service. Not how many mission trips you go on and not how much you give to the poor. The measuring stick of actually knowing him, not believing on his name, knowing him, intimacy, co-union, communion, my friend, my father, my Lord. The barometer scripturally of knowing him is your love. <laughs> he said, if you don't love, you don't know him. He doesn't say you don't pastor. He didn't say you don't go on mission trips. He didn't say you don't serve in the church. But he did say there's one reason if you don't love, it's because you don't know him. See, I love those sermons. I love the one reason. Because if he gave me one of three, now I have to do inventory. Which tells me I can't know him without being changed by him. Like I can't have intimacy without becoming more like him. He wants to impregnate me with who he is. So who he is is the manifestation of my life. Why? Because he made man for his image and gave him a body to fulfill that image, to express it, right? To fulfill his intention till the whole earth is filled with this glory. That's why the psalmist said, what is it about man that you're so mindful of this guy? That you would visit him, that you would give him dominion over the works of your hands, that, that you would make him your crowning creation and glory. What's up with man? To the whole earth be full of his glory. We're waiting on him. He's waiting on us to step into everything he paid for. But to do that, you have to give up you. Why is that hard? You were never made for you anyway. 
Why is it so hard to give up the lie to obtain the truth? Why have we become so accustomed with me, myself, and I when most of us don't even like me, myself, and I when it comes right down to it? 